in the next couple of videos, uh, I would like uh, to link a number of you know, global issues and global concerns about biodiversity uh, to concerns about local uh, bird biodiversity in the northeast of uh, the United States for my students. And so uh, to begin, uh, bird species can become extinct. We know that throughout the world and we certainly know it from North America as well. So from the Marianas Islands, for example, the Mariana Mallard was lost. Um, in the Northeast United States. Uh, it used to be possible to find uh, the Carolina parakeet, um, but this uh, was uh, hunted to uh, extinction. Um, the passenger pigeon was estimated to be the most abundant bird in North America, and then its numbers um, uh, were completely uh, decimated. Now it is uh, completely uh, extinct. Um, and certainly uh, there are a number of other uh, bird species which have uh, become uh, extinct. So uh, whether it uh, be, you know, birds from other areas such as the great auk, the moas, the elephant bird, uh, etc., or birds from North uh, America, um, bird species uh, certainly can become uh, extinct. In the Northeast of the United States, uh, the heath hen, uh, the Bachman's warbler, and uh, others. Now, the concern continues um, because if we were to consider um, uh, birds, uh, birds are certainly a very diverse group. There are as many species of birds as there are all other land vertebrates. So reptiles, amphibians, and mammals combined, um, the number of bird species uh, exceed them. And so we split birds into you know, different groups. There are uh, orders and families, uh, et cetera. So you know, the birds of you know, they evolved as part of a great family tree. And very often we find uh, different branches of the, um, the family tree are native of certain parts of the world. And so as this family tree uh, evolved, uh, obviously evolved in, in certain locations, and all those birds can fly, nevertheless, uh, birds can um, be, once again, you know, confined to a certain area. And so thus, uh, uh, families of birds, groups of birds, uh, but then individual uh, uh, species, uh, they can have a very limited range and be endemic uh, to certain areas. And so habitat loss such as deforestation or draining of wetlands in a certain part of uh, the world uh, can uh, certainly uh, threaten uh, them. And so if you were to just, you know, go through the various families of birds, uh, one would see that, oh, you know, there's this great, you know, diversity of, um, of bird families. Some are more, uh, more widespread and uh, that uh, there can be bird uh, uh, species which are uh, in danger of uh, uh, of extinction. So uh, while this is a global concern, uh, what one can have the uh, greatest uh, influence on is the birds uh, which occur uh, locally. And so, you know, one of the things I'm kind of encouraging in, in my students is, you know, when I, I talk about uh, woodpeckers in an upcoming uh, video, um, to then uh, be concerned that, you know, there are uh, bird families, uh, including those related to woodpeckers distributed throughout the world, such as toucans, and some of these are in danger of, uh, of extinction, uh, that there are uh, 17 threatened species of, uh, of woodpecker, and that if we were to um, uh, consider woodpeckers, there are a couple which have gone extinct. For example, the two largest woodpeckers, uh, the imperial woodpecker from uh, Mexico and the ivory-billed uh, woodpecker, the two largest woodpeckers have gone extinct. So this is obviously a global concern. Um, but then uh, the best way uh, to act is then to act uh, locally uh, with local woodpeckers. And so you know, this, these videos kind of link those uh, two concepts, you know, the global concern and then uh, local uh, biodiversity. So I'd like to just kind of introduce uh, birds in uh, general uh, as a group and then make a couple of uh, videos uh, which highlight uh, different uh, groups of birds. Um, certainly they are uh, recognizable today. There's nothing else that looks like a bird that isn't. Although if you were to go back in fossil history, there were certainly meat-eating dinosaurs which were extremely similar to birds and 
birds of that time were extremely similar to dinosaurs. And so distinguishing between the two uh, would uh, have uh, been, dif uh, been difficult. Um, obviously, uh, feathers uh, are a distinctive uh, feature, and feathers were modified uh, from uh, scales, uh, and on a bird's body, uh, there are places where there are scales and there are places where there uh, are uh, feathers, uh, the two, you know, having, uh, you know, uh, once upon a time, uh, the uh, same ancestral uh, origin. Uh, there are different kinds of uh, feathers, obviously. You can see the downy feathers on uh, these chicks, and also then feathers here. And so while feathers can serve uh, for uh, flight, uh, they also help to serve uh, uh, to keep a warm uh, body temperature constantly. So if birds are going to fly, they need to have better control over body temperature than, say, a, a reptile would. Um, so uh, not only thermoregulation, but also camouflage and courtship, as you saw in uh, those uh, turkeys. Uh, these are, uh, you know, uh, diverse uh, uh, functions of uh, feathers. Um, and much of the bird's uh, anatomy uh, is adapted to flight. Uh, although there are some uh, birds which have been modified it and become flightless. So uh, the majority of birds alive today have a very prominent keel on their sternum for large flight muscles, but then flightless birds may lose this and have a flat sternum because they do not need, need these large uh, uh, chest uh, muscles. Um, so there are a lot of distinctive features about birds. They have a toothless uh, beak, although apparently you know, uh, they still have genes for teeth and there are some mutant chickens which still express teeth. They have a number of fused uh, bones in uh, the skull. They have uh, a long uh, neck with lots of uh, vertebrae. Um, while they have <coughs> the same bones of their wings that in general we have in our arms, uh, many of them are fused. So carpal and metacarpal bones are fused to form a, a carpometacarpus. Uh, the, uh, sacral vertebrae, the hips, uh, they are fused to form a sin sacrum. The tip of the tail is fused to make a pigo style. And so um, birds have lightened their bones, but they need strength you know, to withstand the forces of flight. And so fusing these bones has been a common uh, strategy. Once again, here's the sin sacrum, which includes the hip uh, and uh, the uh, pigo style of uh, the tail. Um, also in the feet, uh, there are fusions of bones, uh, the carpal, uh, the tarsal and metatarsal bones. Uh, the two clavicles are fused to make a wishbone or a furcula. Uh, once again, um, after the first uh, birds, uh, birds develop a large keel on their sternum, which gives them this large area for the chest muscles, uh, which uh, allow for powered uh, flight. Um, there are variations in bird toes. So for example, even in, within woodpeckers, for example, you can see that there are variations in bird toes, but the uh, ancestral uh, state is to have a perching foot in which three toes point forward and one uh, toe uh, points uh, backwards. And so when we look at uh, birds, there are certainly you know, many distinctive features uh, which I mark them. And in, in other videos, for example, in my comparative vertebrate anatomy class, I have many more videos that go into far more detail about um, a bird uh, anatomy, if uh, that's of interest. One of the uh, topics uh, which I'll uh, be returning to uh, frequently uh, in these videos is the idea of uh, migration. Because birds with this warm-blooded endothermic lifestyle need a lot of energy uh, to support it. Um, but uh, there are uh, a lot of food sources like insects or even fish, if the lakes are going to freeze, which are only seasonally available. And so birds with their ability to fly now have the ability to move from one part of the world to another as the seasons change. And that then opens them up to a number of environmental issues because now they're affected by environmental issues in multiple parts of the world since you know, they have a summer habitat, a winter habitat, and an area that they must uh, traverse uh, between um, the two. One of the things that species must determine is um, how to be selective 
in um, during say mating season so that one is mating with one's own group one's own species because if uh, organisms try to mate with other species very often um, uh, that reproductive energy is lost uh, because the embryos fail, the offspring aren't healthy, etc. So how does one in a forest full of birds distinguish between those birds which are part of your group uh, with whom, you know, reproduction is, uh, you know, is possible uh, versus those of a different group? And here's another function of uh, feathers. So you'll notice that, you know, very often similar birds have a very distinctive um, uh, patterns of uh, feathers that then helps mark the species and on its forceful release. Although the syrinx is the mm -hmm. um, other air. I, I'll play it in uh, future videos. Um, the most common birds today, uh, the songbirds, the order uh, of uh, passeriforms, uh, they have modified uh, uh, their uh, throat, uh, an area known as the syrinx, to produce sound. So in addition to having a species, a specific um, a coloration with their feathers, they can produce species specific songs. Because there are so many birds, um, I would like to uh, then look at different bird uh, groups, starting off with uh, some aquatic uh, birds. Now, aquatic birds are common throughout the world, and as one goes to different parts of the world, uh, one can find aquatic birds not found in the Northeast United States. So, for example, there are storks, and there are different kinds of uh, storks, different ones being found in different parts of uh, the world. And so uh, here are some of the storks found uh, in Paraguay, uh, where, I, um, uh, where I lived uh, for a while. Um, here are ibises, which are aquatic birds. Some of these storks, some of these ibises can you know, be found uh, in the southern United States. Uh, some are native uh, to uh, South uh, America. Even where you find you know, species such as herons, which are found in the uh, Northeast United States. Um, you know, uh, you might find uh, the white-necked heron, which looks a great deal like the great blue heron, um, but nevertheless is a different uh, species. Um, <clears throat> and so when we consider local biodiversity, it's important um, because uh, the biodiversity of one geographic area is unique, having species which aren't found elsewhere. And as we saw in this modern world with habitat loss, uh, that as species ranges uh, can, um, uh, uh, can diminish. And uh, so each you know, area has uh, the opportunity to protect uh, wildlife where, uh, they are, uh, uh, where they are native. Um, and so getting to the aquatic birds of the Northeastern uh, United States, uh, loons uh, tend not to spend uh, their entire uh, summer in the Northeastern uh, United uh, or States, or at least in Orange County um, and neighboring uh, regions, um, but certainly need to migrate through. And so uh, one can uh, observe uh, loons uh, in uh, early uh, spring, in autumn, as they are migrating uh, from their uh, summer grounds in the northern U.S. and uh, Canada uh, to where they spend uh, their winters. These birds are so well adapted for diving, uh, where they can hunt fish, as you can see, that their legs are positioned uh, very far back on uh, their uh, bodies to serve as uh, more efficient propellers for kicking. But this makes uh, standing um, and movement outside of, um, of water very difficult. As one surveys the birds that one might find in our area, uh, the uh, double-breasted uh, cormorant um, is uh, another uh, type of aquatic bird uh, which can dive as it hunts uh, for uh, for fish, uh, aquatic invertebrates, and other uh, marine uh, life. Uh, so once again, the cormorant is uh, something which you could observe. 
Uh, the cormorant is a larger uh, bird. Uh, there are uh, smaller aquatic birds as well, uh, such as this grebe, uh, once again, capable of uh, diving. And so when we consider the environmental uh, uh, problems which affect uh, birds, uh, since many of them are very much tied uh, to wetlands, then the draining of uh, wetlands, the flooding of wetlands, the pollution of wetlands, uh, these would obviously then uh, greatly impact uh, all of those um, all of those birds uh, which uh, depend uh, on wetlands and uh, feed there. Uh, there are a number of herons which are found in our area, some larger uh, and some smaller. In general, uh, they uh, stand in their very you know, long legs and uh, their thin bodies, uh, trying to look, at least from uh, below in the water, like aquatic vegetation or uh, the stems of aquatic plants. And then with their long necks, they can rapidly dart into uh, the water uh, to grab uh, their uh, prey. And so here you see a great blue heron, uh, which was capable of you know, eating quite a large uh, catfish, as, uh, as you can see. Um, so uh, the great blue heron is uh, a large heron in our area. Um, slightly less common as seen during migration, but also can be seen for you know, more extensive periods in late summer, is uh, the great egret, uh, which is uh, entirely uh, white, uh, in its coloration. Uh, so uh, these are large um, uh, herons. Uh, and then there are also, uh, oh, and for example, the, the great blue heron, uh, it can nest uh, fairly high uh, in trees. And so if you looked at a very tall tree, you could see uh, the nest of great uh, blue uh, herons. Here you see it walking very uh, slowly, um, uh, uh, hunting for uh, uh, aquatic, uh, life on which it would feed. Um, and then we have uh, smaller herons as uh, well, such as uh, the green uh, heron, um, which has a set of feathers. Uh, sorry. So here you can see uh, the green uh, heron, which is capable of, of raising the feathers on the top of its head. Uh, so herons come uh, in different sizes and shapes. And so uh, the smaller ones would be more likely to feed on a smaller fish and aquatic uh, invertebrates. Um, some uh, herons are known as uh, bitterns and they uh, tend to be uh, a bit more drab in coloration and better uh, camouflage. And so uh, less uh, easy uh, to uh, distinguish. Uh, so there are a number of bitterns, including a large a, a great uh, bitter. Um, while uh, some of these would be native to our area uh, throughout the entire year, uh, others are not typically found here for extended periods, but one could observe, say, a, a snowy egret uh, coming through our area. Uh, and once I observed a cattle egret, uh, these are both small white uh, uh, herons uh, coming through our uh, area. And so uh, these tend to, you know, uh, not be as commonly found here, but you know they are occasional sightings. As is the little blue uh, heron. Uh, once again, not as commonly seen uh, in our uh, area, but possible. Um, there is a, a saying that someone is as thin as a rail. Uh, this is referring to the aquatic bird known as uh, the rail, which lives in our area. Uh, they are secretive and uh, very often are uh, hiding among aquatic vegetation. Uh, so they are rarely uh, seen, uh, but nevertheless, once again, here's an uh, aquatic bird, uh, which would uh, prey on uh, aquatic uh, invertebrates, uh, young fish, you know, tadpoles uh, and the like. And so here is uh, images of, uh, of a rail. Um, there are uh, two birds uh, which tend to uh, have, uh, those were coots, I'm sorry, in the last image. Um, there are uh, two birds uh, which tend to have um, slightly, uh, you know, modified body shapes with slightly shorter legs uh, than what is seen in many of these. 
uh, the snipe and the American woodcock seen here. Note the very long uh, beaks on the American woodcock, which would obviously allow them uh, you know, to, to reach into uh, water and into uh, mud uh, to, uh, to trap uh, aquatic uh, invertebrates. Uh, killdeer are vocal um, birds which are found uh, near, uh, uh, near aquatic uh, habitats, so you're very likely uh, to uh, hear uh, these uh, as they uh, hunt for um, you know, wildlife around uh, these aquatic um, uh, habitats. One interesting thing which is sometimes uh, seen in killdeer is that if you get too close to uh, a nest, uh, the adults uh, can actually uh, pretend uh, to be wounded uh, in an attempt to draw you from uh, the nest. So for example, if I was a predator approaching uh, to the left, there was uh, a nest of the killdeer. Here the adult is making distress sounds and flapping its wings as if it's wounded. And the predator might uh, be uh, uh, tricked into thinking that here's a bird that can't fly that would be easily caught. And the predator might then pursue this bird, which could fly away, but would then be moving away from uh, the nest. All right, so um, uh, various uh, birds then have different uh, degrees of uh, parental uh, care. And here you see, you know, this, you know, bird, you know, potentially sacrificing itself or putting itself in greater risk uh, to protect uh, its uh, its young. Um, there are uh, two species of what are known as yellow legs uh, in our uh, area, which um, uh, the greater and uh, lesser uh, yellow legs. And uh, notice uh, that their long uh, legs uh, clearly, you know, uh, give them this adaptation. Uh, to uh, wade uh, in uh, water and, uh, and hunt for uh, aquatic uh, invertebrates. And um, and then the aquatic birds in our area would obviously then include uh, ducks and uh, geese. Um, uh, so ducks and geese are uh, related, and uh, very often they have a, a widened uh, bill, which helps them scoop up uh, aquatic vegetation. Although they can also feed on aquatic invertebrates, and some, such as the mergansers that you just uh, saw, have narrow bills because they're more adapted, uh, instead of uh, scooping up aquatic vegetation, uh, to hunt for uh, aquatic invertebrates and fish. Uh, they are noteworthy in uh, their migrations because obviously in our area, water bodies freeze uh, over uh, winter and so many uh, will then have to uh, move uh, farther south. And in addition, there are, uh, while wood ducks are uh, found in our area all summer long, as are Canada geese, um, many species do not spend their summers in our area, such as these teals, and so they simply migrate through. So you can see them in our area uh, during the fall migration and uh, the spring migration, um, but you would not see them over summer. But nevertheless, areas such as Orange County um, is very important because here they, uh, you know, they stop, they uh, feed, and this gives them uh, the energy uh, that they need to continue uh, their migration, say north in uh, the spring uh, to Canada and to the northern uh, US. And so if you know, our wetlands were developed or polluted or et cetera, this would have a serious impact on uh, the duck populations farther uh, north of us. And so during these migrations, you know, uh, one can uh, typically see uh, you know, groups of uh, them migrating uh, together. One of the reasons they do this is it saves energy. And when they uh, uh, fly in this V or, or Chevron, uh, formation, just as bikers sometimes will bike uh, behind, uh, you know, someone who takes the lead um, because the resistance of the wind then is less and it takes the, the later bikers less energy um, to bike than it otherwise would. The same thing applies to a uh, duck uh, flight. Um, so there are a number of swans which can be found in our area. 
um, this uh, mute swan is actually not native. It was introduced uh, from uh, Europe and you can actually find it all winter long. If there uh, are bodies of water which do not freeze, um, the mute swan uh, can stay in our uh, area uh, throughout uh, the year. Uh, and so this is the most commonly uh, seen um, swan in our uh, area. Although there are other uh, swans which can uh, be seen, especially during migration, uh, which are um, uh, which uh, are native to our uh, area, such as the trumpeter swan. Um, there are uh, a number of uh, types of geese, but Canada geese would be the most uh, uh, the most common. Um, one of the reasons that they are so common is that ducks do feed on a great deal of vegetation, uh, which is unusual for birds. Uh, because when we think of bird diets, many feed on fish, many feed on insects, um, many feed on fruits and berries, but not too many would say, you know, feed on uh, aquatic vegetation, you know, such as grass or leaves. Um, and that's because the amount of intestine that you would need in order to do that um, would make you have such a big body that flight would be difficult. So Canada geese um, and ducks in, in general, uh, they are feeding more on vegetation, which makes them unusual among uh, uh, birds. But obviously, if a bird can do that, vegetation is an easy food source to come by. Now, uh, snow creek geese can migrate through our area and can be seen. Um, and in some years, uh, flocks may stay here in the winter. Now, this isn't a constant where one can rely, say, in Orange County, New York, that one will see uh, snow geese in uh, the winter. But then there would be some winters that if you went, you know, to say the uh, New Jersey border at the Liberty Loop, that, you know, you could uh, reliably uh, see uh, snow geese um, there. Um, they would not stay throughout uh, the year unless, in this example, so uh, here is an example where apparently a snow goose damaged its wing and one was unable uh, to fly and so could be seen uh, throughout uh, the summer along with these, you know, Canada geese. I uh, notice it's a, um, and this is no uh, longer winter, um, but this was unusual. This bird was unable uh, to complete uh, its migration with uh, the rest of uh, the group. Um, there are other geese, including uh, the brant, which can be seen in our area. I've uh, seen them in our area, but they are unusual. Um, but they would be more common, say, uh, in the lower Hudson. Uh, so here's a brant that's occurring in our area with Canada goose, Canada geese around it. Uh, but uh, this would uh, be a more common goose to find uh, closer to the ocean as the uh, Hudson uh, then uh, opens up uh, into uh, the bay. Um, as we get then to, uh, uh, to ducks, uh, ducks can be split into two groups. The dabbling ducks, uh, which feed not by diving underwater, but by simply upending themselves and then reaching uh, their heads into shallow water. Um, but then there are also diving uh, ducks. And so we could split the ducks into dabbling ducks versus diving ducks. Uh, their coloration patterns uh, are often you know, quite distinctive. And once again, uh, one of the ways that birds know who belongs to their group and who is appropriate to mate with is uh, you know, the coloration of feathers. Uh, here you see a male wood duck. Notice how brilliant the coloration uh, pattern uh, is. Um, so male wood ducks would have this coloration during a mating season, um, but juveniles um, and females would have the coloration uh, that you uh, saw in the previous image where you know, there's a, a white spot around uh, their uh, eyes, um, but they lack uh, this uh, bright uh, uh, coloration. Uh, wood ducks uh, do remain in our area uh, throughout uh, the summer, so they are not simply migrating through. Pintails get their name from the long tail feathers that they possess. Uh, these migrate uh, through our uh, area and uh, can represent you know, a member of the early uh, migrating uh, uh, ducks. And so here you see uh, pintails with their brown head and long tail feathers. Uh, once again, Orange County is important for them because they must get nourishment here uh, to uh, continue uh, their journey uh, northwards, say in spring or southwards in, um, in uh, autumn. 
Uh, here's a black duck looking a lot like a mallard, um, but uh, not possessing that bright uh, green uh, uh, head, right? Uh, and so uh, that is another species of, uh, uh, of dabbling duck. And notice that they're not diving underwater, simply um, uh, reaching their head under. And notice that in addition to aquatic vegetation, they can also feed on fish or aquatic invertebrates, as you saw uh, with that black duck uh, in the previous image. Uh, here is a green-winged uh, teal. Uh, so they do have this obvious cinnamon head, but if you look at their wings, you'll see uh, a uh, patch of, uh, of green. Uh, there is a teal called the cinnamon teal. Uh, this is not it. Um, uh, so uh, notice it's dabbling, simply upending uh, itself. And the same then is true of widgeons, uh, uh, which have uh, uh, you know, several colors uh, on uh, their head. Um, once again, dabbling ducks, as you can see, just uh, upending them, uh, themselves. Um, the shoveler has a much uh, longer and broader beak than is typical. Uh, and uh, we'll see uh, in a little bit uh, ducks which have narrower beaks. And so even though they're all feeding in the same wetland, uh, they may have you know, modifications which adapt them you know, to specialize in certain types of, uh, of prey. So here you see the um, northern shoveler, uh, the male and the female there, the male having a, a more uh, distinctive coloration uh, pattern. Um, uh, but then uh, once again, notice the, the uh, shovel-shaped uh, bill, which allows it uh, to scoop up more, uh, uh, more food. Um, and now uh, I'll, I'll go through some of the diving ducks. So notice that unlike the dabbling ducks, which are simply uh, upending themselves, these actually dive underwater so they can get into deeper spots uh, to get you know, vegetation or aquatic invertebrates. Uh, the ring-neck ducks, uh, they're among the earliest of uh, migrants. And so when the duck migrations begin in early spring, uh, you would probably be seeing uh, the ring-neck ducks. Uh, now, uh, the ring neck ducks have an obviously ring around their bill, but if you look closely, you can see that there's a brown ring around uh, their necks uh, as uh, well. It was a little more obvious in a previous uh, image. So these are diving ducks, and um, they are on their way uh, farther north uh, in spring. A little later in the migration uh, come ducks such as buffleheads. So here you see the male with the larger white spot and the female. Uh, these are smaller ducks, and they are also uh, diving, uh, uh, diving uh, ducks, as you'll see here. This one will go underwater, right? Um, and uh, similar to the uh, uh, bufflehead is uh, another small duck not seen as commonly in our area, known as the golden eye. So here you see male and female golden eyes. Uh, once again, these are diving ducks. They don't uh, spend the entire summer in our area, uh, they are simply uh, migrating through. Um, there are a, a number of ducks which can be seen, um, but maybe with less and less uh, frequency. So if you are a bird watcher, then there are some ducks which you know you can see often, say in our area in Orange County, um, but would not uh, necessarily see each uh, each year. Um, so for example, ruddy ducks, which were the, the previous video. So here you see ducks uh, known as ruddy ducks uh, and the angle at which the tail feathers uh, project is one of uh, the distinctive uh, features uh, with uh, them. So once again, ruddy ducks, uh, they um, are a little less common in our uh, area. And then there are some uh, ducks which are occasional. So you, know, you certainly certainly count on seeing them in a season, but one could, uh, such as uh, the canvasback, uh, which is a larger duck with a reddish head, or even then uh, the red head, which is a smaller duck with a red head. Um, these are more commonly found uh, closer to salt water and marshes. And so if you were closer to the coast, uh, one would more reliably see those, say, more along the Hudson um, uh, and it's, uh, uh, once again, closer to the coast, but it can be seen in our area. So this is a canvas back 
uh, from our area in Orange uh, County. Here's a redhead, which is a smaller duck, once again, unusual uh, in our area, uh, but nevertheless, uh, sometimes found. Um, some of the ducks in our area are called mergansers, and they have narrow bills, not for scooping up aquatic vegetation, but more for the ability to uh, feed on aquatic invertebrates. Uh, so here you see the common merganser. Uh, the male has you know, this white plumage and a, a green head, whereas juveniles and females uh, have you know, a ruddy uh, color in the, the feathers on their head. So you can see males and uh, females of the common uh, merganser. Um, one can sometimes see these throughout uh, winter. Uh, so sometimes they can spend all year long uh, here. Um, and then there is uh, another smaller species with a distinctive black head and a white spot known as the hooded merganser. Notice the narrow bill which occurs uh, in its, um, uh, to help it uh, hunt for aquatic uh, uh, invertebrates. Um, and so this was just kind of a survey into the diversity of aquatic birds which we have in our uh, area. And once again, um, we worry about wildlife throughout the world. We actually think that the period of extinction that we're living through is tied for the second worst in the past 500 million years. So wildlife is certainly being stressed. And while one can concern uh, oneself with, uh, you know, species which are endangered, you know, and the loss of habitat throughout the world, um, it is in one's local area that one can have the greatest impact on wetlands, the conservation uh, of them. And many of the birds that you've just seen not only rely on wetlands in our area um, uh, during summer, um, but some rely on it uh, for migration routes. And so the summer birds of, say, northern New York and Canada depend on our area um, as they migrate uh, through. 